Sermon text today comes from the book of Job. If you're in your few Bibles, that's page 793 and 794. If you're in your own Bibles, that's Job chapter 5. We'll go through the whole chapter today, verses 1 to 27. Before we begin, um, just to catch us up, Job is the story of a man who at one point had much, in fact, maybe more than almost anyone we could imagine in our own lives. He was, he was a man of great abundance and a righteous man. But he came on from some difficult struggles, a struggle brought on by Satan through a uh, request from the Lord to test Job. And Job lost everything, lost everything he had in this world, including his children. And he mourns for seven days. And during that seven days, his his three friends come from far away to, to be with him in that morning period. Their names are uh, Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they sit with him in silence for seven days. And then after seven days, Job begins to speak, begins to express his mourning, his, the depth of his pain. And after Job finishes speaking, then Elphaz begins to speak in response to what Job has said um, in all his suffering. Elphaz began to speak last week when we looked at, in Job chapter 4, and we see what the, the rest of Elphaz's speech in chapter 5 today will finish out his first speech today. But something you need to know and understand about Elphaz is that he is a rationalist. And you know people like this in your own life. People who try to make sense of everything. It doesn't make sense to them that they're just, their minds are going to overheat for something. They've got, they've got to make sense. So Eliphaz is trying to make sense of Job's suffering the best way that he can. And in the first chapter, we see the way in which he's trying to make sense of it. In essence, he says this. Okay, I figured it out, Job. Here's what your problem is. Nobody's perfect. That's why you're suffering. Because nobody's perfect compared to God. All of us have sinned, and so all of us are going to struggle. Nobody's perfect, Job. But you're pretty good. So God is surely going to come to your aid and your rescue. So, fuck up, buddy. Cheer up. That's, that's where Eliphaz is coming from. And he continues to give um, his speech, which, which is very much in the same line. To read much of it. But there's really, I mean, as we're reading Eliphaz's speech, there's really two ways to take it. One is to ask the question, is Eliphaz's speech helpful to Job? Is it helpful when someone tries to rationalize the pain that you're going through? And often the answer, maybe most of the time, the answer is no. It's not very helpful, is it, to have someone in the deep, in, in the depths of your immense pain try to say, well, you know, let's figure this out. I don't want to figure it out. I'm hurting. Right? So is it helpful? No, not necessarily. But here's the question I, I really want us to focus in on today. We'll, we'll talk about how, later on, how, how he might have been more helpful. But today I want to ask this question, is it true? Is what Eliphaz says true? And the answer to that question is yes. It may not be helpful, but it is true. And I think there's some truth that God builds into Eliphaz's speech here that we need to pay attention to. Um, and so let's look at, at what Eliphaz says today in verses, um, in chapter 5, beginning in verses 1 to 7. Call if you will, but who will answer you? To which of the holy ones will you turn? Resentment kills a fool, and envy slays the simple. I myself have seen a fool taking root, but suddenly his house was cursed, his children far from safety, crushed in court without a defender. The hungry consume his harvest, taking it even from among thorns, and the thirsty pant after his wealth. For hardship does not spring from the soil, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. Yet a man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. You guys all remember the little sayings that your parents had that helped you like comprehend life? I mean, all of us have had, I don't know, most of us at least have had these little sayings that have stuck with us. My dad used to say something to me when I said, Dad, he told me to do something that I thought was unfair. I said, Dad, it's unfair. I shouldn't have to do this. You know what he'd say? Son, life's tough. Then you die. That's it. 
life's tough, then you die. And there's some truth to that, right? Life is tough, and you do die. And so you got to come to term with, terms with those two difficult things. Life's tough, then you die. Something similar you might have heard before. There's only two sure things in life, death and taxes, right? You heard that one? Same sort of deal, right? The only two things that are sure, death and taxes. Well, verse 7 might fit into the category of these sorts of sayings, wouldn't it? Man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. We're destined to have trouble in this life. You have a pulse? Well, then you're going to have trouble. That's the way it goes. That's human beings are destined for trouble. And that's the point that Eliphaz is bringing up. But it, he also wants us to understand that it's not as though trouble just poof magically comes as a result of us living. There's a reason that trouble comes to all of us who are living. And the reason that he outlines throughout the entire first chapter, and then as we'll see here today, is this. It's simple, but it's true. Everyone sins, therefore everyone suffers. All of us are sinners. And all of us are going to suffer as sinners. Now, let me be careful here. It doesn't mean that every time you suffer, it is a direct result of something that you have done. Sometimes we suffer just because we live in a sinful, broken world. Or we suffer because of other people's sins. Sometimes that happens too. But nonetheless, we all fall into the category of sinner, don't we? And so we all live into the same condition. A condition where we suffer. So, a couple of questions come to mind as we think about this in our own lives. One, will I suffer? And the answer, yeah, I'm going to suffer. Will my suffering be justified? And again, the answer is yes. It doesn't mean, again, it's not that it's directly linked to anything I did per se, but I am a sinner, and therefore suffering for sinners is justified. The penalty for sin is death. Anything less than that is mercy. But, but perhaps the better question, the more relevant question that might actually help us, is this. What are you going to do when that suffering comes? What are you going to do when that suffering comes? God, through the Holy Spirit, writes in verse 2 that resentment kills a fool. We can become resentful because of the things that happen to us in life, can't we? Have you met people who are bitter, resentful? And, and it's hard to point a finger. I mean, sometimes if, we, if somebody, something really awful has happened to someone and they're sort of bitter as a result of it, we kind of go, hey, if that happened to me, I might feel the same way. I mean, it's hard to, to point that finger. Uh, in fact, and if we did, we might be like Eliphaz here, sort of not very helpful. But nonetheless, it can happen. Maybe, well, well, I mean, think about it in your own life. The difficult things that have happened to you or the challenges in your life. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe your marriage has fallen apart. Maybe your dreams have crumbled. Maybe there's even been some worst case scenarios where you've been beaten or raped. And you wonder, how can I not become resentful when those sorts of things happen? How can I not become bitter? And if you're not careful, it will happen. It's the natural way, thing we fall into. We, we, we let that bitterness and that resentfulness and that unforgiving heart take over our lives and characterize the rest of the days that we live so that the rest of the days that we live are really more like dying because they're characterized by these awful things instead of being characterized by living. If we're not careful, resentment kills the fool, says in verse 2. But what's the alternative? I mean, when something really bad like that happens in your life, in Job's life, what's the alternative? Well, Eliphaz proposes the alternative in these next verses. Look at verses 8 to 16. But if it were I, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him. 
He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. He bestows rain on the earth. He sends water upon the countryside. The lowly he sets on high, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He thwarts the plan of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are swept away. Darkness comes upon them in the daytime. At noon they grope as the night. He saves the needy from the, sword, from the sword. He saves them from the clutches of the powerful so that the poor have hope and injustice shuts its mouth. In these verses, Eliphaz points out that God is able to make everything that is wrong that has happened to you right. He says it to Job, but it applies here. Everything that's wrong that's happened to you, God has the ability, the ability to make right. In fact, he, he says that, that God makes us right in two different ways, and we see them in these verses. I'll show you. First of all, that God is able to restore you. Look at verses 10 and 11. He bestows rain on the earth. He sends water upon the countryside. If you're thinking about a, a land of drought, a dry soil, what can dry soil do to make itself not dry anymore? Nothing. Right? It has to wait upon what? Rain. Upon the rain. And in the same thing, when, when bad things happen to us, when, when those seasons of dryness come into our lives, or even worse, what can we do to make it right? Nothing. But, here's, but God can. He bestows rain on the earth. He sends water upon the countryside. The lowly He sets on high. And those who mourn are lifted to safety. The promise here is that God is able to, to restore you. In every way that you've been broken and knocked down, God can lift you back up and heal you. But the other way in which God makes us right is in bringing justice. It's not just enough to restore us. Sometimes before healing can really happen, justice has to happen. And, and we see those promised in these verses too, that God punishes those who wrong you, verses 12 and 13. He thwarts the plan of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are swept away. Then look over at verse 16. The poor have hope, and injustice shuts its mouth. God doesn't always correct the difficulties in our life right away, or in the time that we think He should, or, or even in the way that we expect that He will. But He does always correct the things that have gone wrong in our life, whether it be in here, in this life, or in eternity. And often it's the latter, friends, that God will make all things right in the time of eternity. It's difficult for us to see that in our 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years on this earth. But God's perspective is eternal, and His promise is to make all things just and right. The other thing that these verses do before we move on um, to the end here is that they help us to shift our focus. Sometimes when we suffer, we can get so narrowly focused on our own suffering, on our own lives, that we fail to realize we're a part of a much bigger story. And so what Eliphaz wants Job to do, and, and what we can take encouragement from here, is to move our focus from ourselves, from our suffering, to God, and God who's able. To move from, uh, from cries of, why me, to cries of, praise God from whom all blessings flow. He encourages us to move from lament to doxology. That's a fancy way to say praising God. And I think it's important for us to ask this question at this time. What's the focus in your life? I mean that. that. I mean, if there's one question I want you to walk away pondering, it's this. What is the focus in your life? Because that'll characterize so much else. In the moments when, when you're not engaged, when you're not actually doing something, where does your mind wander? Where does it go to? What do you like to think about? What do you like to do when you have a, a free opportunity? What's the focus of your life? Your family? Your finances? Are you anxious? Are you happy? What, what's the focus of your life? 
Job's focus in the beginning chapters of this book, and, and really throughout the entire book, Job's focus is on God. He is a righteous man. He, he offers sacrifices regularly. His attention is directed solely at God. But Eliphaz's co comment here is a warning to Job to say, hey, listen, Job, don't let this tragedy move your focus. Tragedy can do that in our lives. It can move our focus away from God and on to, woe is me. Woe is me. Why did this happen to me? Instead of saying, God, what are you doing in this world? What's your action? Tragedy and natural disasters can shift our focus. Our own sins that we've committed can shift our focus. We can begin to think, oh, I know I, I was uh, a Christian. I loved God, but now I've fallen and, and I'm, I've gone too far. And, I, and surely God can't save me now. You know, surely I've done too much. We get our focus on the things that I've done wrong instead of all that Christ has done right for us. Our own sins can shift our focus. I want to bring up Hebrews chapter 12. Um, part of it was read earlier today, but I want to read just a few from a few verses earlier. It says this, Hebrews 12, 2. Fix your eyes on Christ. Talking about focus. Fix your eyes on Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. We often think about Christ as the author of our faith. We come to faith in Christ. I'm saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. And our lives are changed in that moment. But as time goes on, we begin to lose that focus. We begin, the fire in us begins to, begins to fade away. And, and we lose that focus so that we wonder, oh, goodness, am I still a Christian at all? And, and the command here is to fix your eyes on Christ. It's a command about focus. Not only because he did save you, but he's in the process of saving you. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. The author and the perfecter. He didn't just begin a good work in you. He will accomplish that good work in you. Part, one of the wonderful aspects of the good news of Jesus Christ is not that we have to depend on our ability to keep Christ, but we can depend on his ability to keep us. That's the good news of the gospel. And as long as we remain focused on that, then all of a sudden our suffering uh, begins to take on new meaning and new significance, which, which leads us into these next verses. Verses 17 to 27. Let's look at those verses, finishing this chapter. Blessed is the man who's, uh, whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. From six calamities he will rescue you, and seven no harm will befall you. In famine he will ransom you from death, and in battle from the stroke of the sword. You will be protected from the lash of the tongue, and need not fear when destruction comes. You will laugh at the destruction and famine, and need Need not fear the beast of the earth, for you will have a covenant with the stones of the field, and the wild animals will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock in your property and find nothing missing. You will know that your children will be many, and your descendants like the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor, like sheaves gathered in season. We have examined this, and it is true, so hear it and apply it to yourself. And there Eliphaz's first speech ends. One of the things that he teaches us here at the end of this speech is that the more we shift our focus on God, the more that we can understand the suffering in our lives. Now, sometimes that doesn't help, understanding the suffering. Sometimes you're just in pain and you say, I don't really care why I hurt. I just wish I didn't hurt. But there are other occasions when understanding why we suffer helps. You go to the doctor and, and he's able to accurately diagnose what's going on and whether or not you actually do anything different, just knowing, just knowing gives you a little bit of relief and, and something to sort of look toward your, your own symptoms if you understand what's going on. Sometimes understanding helps. I would, 
thinking about this in my own life. Being a parent teaches you so much about, about God and his relationship to, to us. And um, my kids, particularly Kalea, I'm thinking my, my, my middle daughter, she, uh, she hates getting shots. I mean, who likes shots? Nobody likes shots. I don't like shots. But it's difficult when you have a little girl who doesn't understand why she's having to get shots. It's, Mom, Dad, why are you letting them hurt me? You know, that's hard. That's hard to, to say, uh, here I am letting a doctor or a nurse hurt my child as far as they can see, and they don't understand why. Well, just recently, this last season, Kalea got ill. I don't think it was the flu, but it was something that really, you know, knocked her on her, knocked her on her butt. She didn't like it at all. It was, it was not being, it was not fun being sick the way that she was. And then she understood everything we'd been telling her about, well, we get these shots so you don't get sick. And then she said, well, let's go get that flu shot, <laughs> right? It helps to understand, doesn't it? Helps to understand why we suffer. It does. God allows us to suffer, and so to those ends, we want to understand why. And God allows us to suffer for two main reasons these verses describe. Um, the first is for our discipline. God allows us to suffer for the sake of discipline. Look at verse 17. Blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. God gives us, as a result of our sin, sometimes a little taste of death. The penalty for sin is death. And sometimes God allows, as a result of our sin, our relationships to fall apart, our jobs to fall through the cracks. Um, God allows us to lose and to hurt a great deal because it is a foretaste of death. And He would rather us be corrected now than go headlong into hell. And so he allows us to, to face a little bit of suffering so that we can become averse to it, so that we can be corrected away from it, that our soul will begin to run from it instead of run toward it. Sometimes God disciplines us in this way. Again, parenting helps uh, figure this out. Zane, I, I've never raised a little boy until now, but Zane is growing up and he's hitting. He's hitting his sisters sometimes. And uh, if you grow up and you're like a 30-year-old man hitting people, guess what happens? You go to jail for a long time if you're hitting people. And so guess what we do? And we give him a little foretaste of that. We, he, he goes through his room and he spends a lot of time in his room alone. And he doesn't like it. But it's for his good that he can learn before the real thing happens. Um, it's it's, it's a, a discipline, a foretaste that God allows us to have. The second reason that God allows us to suffer, though, and this, this maybe is more helpful for someone who, who doesn't directly relate what's going wrong in their life to something that they did. There is another reason we suffer. And, and the second reason we suffer is that God wants to push us away from the disease of our broken nature toward the cure in Jesus Christ. He wants to push us away from being comfortable in our world to being comfortable in Him. And sometimes there's no way to do that except to make us uncomfortable in this world. He's not doing it to be mean, but he's doing it because life is only really in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Some people will say, Pastor, listen, and this is what I mean. They'll say, listen, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was living a life that's just fine. I was okay. And, uh, you know, I was living a pretty decent life. Maybe I wasn't pursuing God as much as I should have or at all, but I wasn't doing anything wrong. Why did this suffering come on me? And the answer is this, that God will do anything God will do anything to keep you from staying away from Him. If you're going to spend your life staying away from Him, even if it's comfortable, He's not going to let you stay there if you're His. He's going to pursue you, whether it be through joy or pain. He's going to bring you to Himself. And you know, the, it strikes me between the last service and this one, this is a, a new ending to the sermon, so to speak, but it strikes me that that's true, that there's nothing God won't do to keep you staying away from Him. And the proof of that is not that He makes you suffer, but that He sent His only Son into the world for the purpose of suffering for you, to take the penalty for your sin on the cross. 
so that if you put your faith in him, what you will have is a total unity with God. Now, do we still live in a sinful and broken world? Absolutely we do. But in Christ Jesus, we have this wonderful promise that we will be with him. And not only that, we'll be totally right with him because of and through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen.